What's up, church? How are you? <laughs> Thank you, guys. Just so excited. Thanks for everyone who drove back to support me. These are my college peeps. I'm the college pastor. Uh, thank you so much for just coming out this morning on this summer day, right? I love football, but the fall weather hopefully is over, right? We want to experience summer and the sunshine, so I am just so excited and uh, just blessed to have the opportunity to share. You know miracles happen when they let the college pastor preach twice in one year. So I don't know how that happens. They gave me the mic, even though the sound guys really control it. I know that. <laughs> but I'm just so thankful to share. Hey, we are in a series called Google or God. If you were here last week, the one and only Clay Harrington gave a powerful message looking at are we lazy or are we diligent? And we're really, I don't know about you, but I think all the time when something breaks in the house, how do we fix it? Well, I call my uncle and then he says, Ryan, did you Google it? <laughs> we go to Google for so much, right? Sometimes I think, how would we live life without Google or YouTube? I mean, I got a new puppy. The thing's biting everyone, biting everything he sees. I Google, how does this puppy stop biting? Especially me, because he loves to bite me, right? We go to Google so, so much. And I just felt like as we were preparing, you know, I don't know about you, but when, we, when I type in an address in my GPS, I don't really doubt it. I trust it, right? When I go to Google and I type in something, I trust what it says. And I just felt like the Father asked me, and I wanted to ask you, as much as we trust Google and as much as we go to Google, will we begin to trust and listen to him like we do with those other resources he's given us? You know, we're in this series looking at the book of Proverbs in Google or God. And Proverbs is a wisdom book. This guy named King Solomon, he was David's son. You know, God came to him and said, you can have one gift, any gift in the world, what would you want? I don't know if it, if it was me, I would have said, make me an NFL football player. Can I get an amen? Corey, I know I saw you in here, right? You know that, bro. Like, man, love NFL, that would have been me. But he said, give me wisdom. Give me wisdom. And he wrote a book to his kids so generations of people could know the wisdom of the Lord that God had given him. And that's why we're looking in this series. We love Google, but we love God more. And we want to look to the book of Proverbs and really glean from the wisdom because Proverbs has so many principles in it. But you know how we live out those principles, church? Is living it out in relationship with Jesus. Asking the precious and, and Holy Spirit to speak to us and to guide us and to help us live this life how he's called us to live. So I ask you, as we look at today's message, will you ask yourself, do we take time to trust him and listen to him just like we go to Google? Will you pray with me? Father, I just thank you so much for the opportunity just to be a part of this family. God, I just ask you, Holy Spirit, to come even more. We thank you that you are here. We thank you that you promised where two or three gathered, surely you will be with us. Let us just, let that just penetrate our hearts, God, that the King of kings and the Lord of lords is here with us. Have your way, God. Please speak to me. Please speak through me and inspire us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I, uh, I don't know if you, anyone was here last week, but Clay gave an awesome challenge. And he challenged anyone who would want to go on this journey with him. He's actually doing it on Facebook Live every night to read the book of Proverbs chapter by chapter, one chapter at a time. And me and some of my family, we've been reading it, you know, by ourselves. And then we text each other what God's speaking to us. And it's been such a fruitful time of taking 15 to 20 minutes a day and read God's word. And not just read it like a... a, a, a a study book that we're studying in our minds, but letting the author of our faith speak to us about how it applies to our lives. And as I've been reading, I just felt like it would be so important to read uh, Proverbs 1, 1 through 7 to explain again how important this book is. It says this, The purpose of Proverbs is to teach people wisdom and discipline, to help them understand the insights of the wise. Their purpose is to, is to teach people to live disciplined and successful lives, to help them do what is right, just, and fair. These Proverbs will give insight to the simple, knowledge and discernment to the young. Let the wise listen to these Proverbs and become even wiser. Let, let those with understanding receive guidance by exploring meaning in these Proverbs and parables, the words of the wise and their riddles. For fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge, 
but fools despise wisdom and discipline. And I said, wow, that is the book. It was like if we could write a book of our lives and leave that for our family and generations to come, that this book has so much wisdom. But again, it's applied and meaningful as we read it and as we live it with Jesus. And today we're going to look at, as Clay looked at, lazy or diligent, we're going to look at a topic that I'll be honest, church, that I wasn't too excited about speaking about at first. And it's actually been a hard week of a lot of people praying for me and a lot of sermon practices and sermon practices and rewrites and rewrites. But I'll be honest, I'm finally excited. And I'm not just saying it because I'm up here, but I am. Because this is something the Lord is teaching, teaching me and opening my heart about it. But it's the issue of money. And we're looking at today, are we poor or are we rich? And I know some of you might be like, oh gosh, another sermon about tithing, another sermon about money, because that's the way I was every time someone at church would bring this up. But God is showing me and opening my heart to a revelation of what true richness in Christ is. And he's showing me that when we first realize and experience and come to believe that we're rich in here by our relationship with him, he opens our eyes to see how we're rich out there. When we're rich in the spiritual, he opens our eyes and our hearts to see how we're rich in the physical. And I don't know about you, but growing up, I was confused about money. I grew up, you know, my mom and my dad were high school sweethearts. They went to college, and then I happened. And I kind of grew up with this mindset that even though I had two parents, even though they weren't together, that loved me, two families, you know that quote that says it takes a village to raise someone? Well, it took like three villages to raise me. Raise me. Amen, Aunt, Aunt Dawn, Uncle Rich, right? You know, they're still doing it. And, um, you know, Rich didn't know he has three kids, but he didn't know that he also had a 31-year-old son that he was going to have to adopt, you know. Every time something breaks in the house, Uncle Rich, how do you do this? Go to Google, Ryan, you know. (laughs) But, you know, like I grew up with this attitude and this mentality of that everything's against me. Why was I born into a situation that I didn't want? Why can't my parents be together? Why can't they be the normal age that most other parents are? Why are they so young? Why can't I have these name brand things and things that my other friends' parents have? You know, growing up, my, my mom, um, even though my, my dad paid child support and he's a great dad and we're close, he traveled a lot for his job, so he wasn't there for the day-to-day grind. And a lot of times it was just me and my mom. You know, I was a man of the house in third grade. And we, we lived very frugal lives. Uh, my mom, you know, left college and, and worked a job so she, so she could support me. And growing up, I couldn't have the name brand clothes, the name brand things that some of my friends did. But as we got older, you know, my dad started to get more successful in his job, and his side of the family was a, was a little more well-off than my mom's side. And I remember for Christmas, I got like an Abercrombie and Fitch sweatshirt. And I was like, whoa, Abercrombie and Fitch, let's go. My game is rising, you know. And then I even one time, I got a ping pong table. And I was like, dude, I got a ping pong table for Christmas. Like, I am rich. Like, I should be on TV or something, you know. Like, I was, my mind was blown because I literally thought, like, athletes and celebrities and all these people with all this money, like, literally had superpowers. Like, I thought they were, like, Superman or Batman. Like, somehow they just have these cool powers, you know. And, um, and I, I just didn't understand And I'll be honest, guys, even though I had a great family around me, I had a poverty mindset that saw everything against me. I didn't know why I was born in this situation, and I I was just upset. I was mad, and I just felt like God was against me, and I just was always the second man out, you know, the, the, the underdog. I always had a chip on my shoulder where I had to prove to people that I was never good enough, and I had to prove it and earn their love. And my whole life, I lived that way. And I ask you, can you ever relate to that? Can you relate to not feeling good enough? To not even though people loved you and you had so many good things around you, you just kind of felt that you weren't like others. And that's how I felt about money. That's how I felt about being rich. You know, um, as I was praying, it amazed me that I just felt like God asked us that The first step in really believing that we're rich is knowing our value. Do you guys know that you've been bought with a price? That you are valuable, that you are seen, that you are expensive to God. I want you to think about one of the most expensive things in your lives right now. You know, monetary things, not, you know, something that you could give to someone. For me, 
I got a new car for the first time in my life in September. Well, it actually wasn't brand new. It was a month old, but it was, it was new to me. <laughs> and I don't know about you, but I know how much I paid for that car and still have to pay on it. And when some people and some of my college peeps know this, they come in the car and they bring like a Coca-Cola or something. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You can't bring that in this car. Like, you see those leather seats? Like, that Coke spills on that car. Like, I know how expensive this car is. Just the other day, like, it got a nick on it, you know, and I'm like, man, where'd this nick come on the car? Like, man, this thing is expensive. Like, I'm still paying for it. But could you imagine, like, that's just a silly car, that we are expensive, we are valuable, that we have been bought with a price. And I feel like that's the first thing God wants us to know today, church, that even though we have circumstances that are hard, I've been with the poor of poor. I've been on the mission field. I went on a, a trip where I went to 11 countries in 11 months, and I, I've been to over 20 countries, and I don't say that braggadociously, I say it humbly, but I've lived in villages where we re- eat rice and, rice and beans every single day, where when you need to go to the restroom, you go find a hole in somewhere where no one else is around, and that's how you go to the restroom. That literally I've given a banana or an orange to children where their eyes light up like it's a piece of chocolate cake or it's a Snickers bar. And they are so thankful. I've met people that literally live in homes a quarter of the stage, uh, size of the stage. And yet they have such a joy. They have such an identity, not in what they have, but whose they have. They have an identity in who they are in Christ and who he is in them. They've served me their last cup of tea, their last loaf of bread with such a generosity in their eyes that it just humbles me and blows me up because they're giving me all that they have and it doesn't matter to them because they know that they have more than what they, that meets the eye. They know that they have a treasure in heaven and that one day they, when we get to heaven, they are going to be the ones that have mansions that are helping other people. But their identity is not rooted In the physical, it's rooted in the spiritual. So I ask you, would you take a chance with me? And today, and even though we're in hard situations, which I know that it's like, I've been to paycheck, to paycheck. I've seen my mom struggle. I've been there. I even am there in some ways myself. But will you trust that God loves you? He sees you. You are valuable to him. And he, he loves you and has an amazing plan for your life. I believe that there is so much power in declaring things. And do you know, I say this all the time to you guys, that it's, it's a scientific fact that our brains listen to our own voice more than any other voice in our world. And that's why when we memorize things like math equations or, you know, learning a language, it's, it's very helpful to say it out loud. But do you guys know that when we declare who God is and who we are, it makes a difference? It changes things first in us and then the places we go. It changes things. And I believe the first aspect, I feel like God give, has given me a couple points to share that can help us really start to believe and live out this thing that we are rich in Christ. We are rich because he is rich. And, it, and I believe that when we look at these things, it will change us and then change everyone around us. Check out this verse from 2 Corinthians that says this. You know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty he could make you rich. I love the Amplified version that says this, for you are recognizing more clearly the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, his astonishing kindness, his generosity, generosity, his gracious favor, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor. So that by his poverty, you might become rich, which means abundantly blessed. Abundantly blessed. Again, I I know I'm hitting this, this hard, but I've been reading this book. And every time a pastor has talked about tithing or money, I wanted to turn the other way. And Hap, who I love and respect so much, challenged me. And he said, Ryan, you know it up here, but you don't know it in here. Read this book. If you haven't read this, it's in the bookstore. And there's this amazing quote that says this. Somewhere, where did I put it? I lost it. There it is. It says, a blessed person may or may not be wealthy by the world standards, but they enjoy a quality of life that most billionaires would envy. That most billionaires would envy. 
There was a recent article I read in USA Today about a famous quarterback named Ryan Leaf. He was taken in the 1998 draft right after Peyton Manning, Hall of Famer that most of us probably know. Um, and Ryan Leaf was in the NFL only for a couple years, and he had a pretty unsuccessful career. And after he was out of the NFL, his whole identity and purpose was in the NFL, and he became depressed. He didn't know what his reason for being alive was. And he started getting addicted to painkillers and made some choices that ended up landing him in jail because of his addiction. And he was sentenced for seven years in jail. And in, this, in jail, day after day, he just kept to himself. He just laid in his cell. He was depressed. He didn't want to be alive. And finally, one day, his cellmate said, man, Wake up. You have an amazing purpose to your life. Yes, I know you had a hard story and you wanted to be a Hall of Famer in the NFL like Peyton Manning. Everyone, you know, they always compared the two. But you still have purpose to your life. And you know what? A light bulb went on and he realized there was a mindset change. That when he could change his mindset and realize that he has a purpose and destiny to his life, it woke him up and it inspired him. And so he decided to start teaching inmates how to read while he was in prison. And because of good behavior, he got out after 32 months instead of seven years. And when he got out, he's like, you know what? I'm going to make a difference for my life. I'm not going to let the story end here. I'm going to choose to make a difference. And he went from making millions of dollars to having his first job ever, making $15 an hour. He made $15 an hour working for an agency that helped um, addicts recover. And he chose to tell his story, and now he's not looked as a failure, but he looked, he's looked on as being a person of hope. And he says, I went from millions to $15, but I'm living the life of my dreams. I'm living the life of my dreams because I found my purpose, and I've changed the way I see things. And I'm surrounded by friends and family and by a peace and an inner joy that I've never had before. And I believe, friends, that as we choose this, as we choose to believe that we are rich and we choose to make this shift in our minds, things will be able to happen and God will amaze us at how he works in us and through us. So maybe some of you are like, well, great, Rye. That sounds all good. Great, you know, feel good story. But um, I'm still in paycheck to paycheck and in situations that I can't get out of. So I will believe that I'm rich. But how does that change the things around me? Well, great. Thanks for asking that, Micah, because I got something to say to you. <laughs> um, you got to pay attention or I will call you out. The college students know that. <laughs> um, I love Micah. I just saw him. His, his name was the first one that came to mind. So, <laughs> um, But I feel like God said a couple things that I want to share. And be like the first aspect is this. That first step to believing and living this thing out is having a thankful heart. Do you guys know that thankfulness is a weapon? Do you know that when we declare these things about who God is and who, are, who we are, things change? That thankfulness to God and thankfulness to others is a weapon. Like, I'll just be real. I believe God heals, and he did heal, he does heal, and he continues to heal. And sometimes it's one and done, and I believe in that, I pray for that. But sometimes it's also a process. And I'm just going to be vulnerable and honest that I've struggled with depression in my life. And there's still days that I wake up, and I'm just sad, and I'm just heavy, and I don't really know why. And you know what I do to snap myself out of it? I get out of bed, I get on my knees, and I say, God, thank you for the gift it is to be alive today. I remind myself who he is and all the things he's done in my life because it awakens me and it inspires me that we're alive for a reason. I tell the students this all the time and they're probably are tired of hearing about it, but like it's really a heart revelation of like we didn't choose to be alive. We didn't choose us. You didn't choose you. You didn't choose your family or your circumstances. I've seen kids in Cambodia who are walking around naked with no parental vision, nothing to eat, and it's like, God, why wasn't I born in that situation? But we've been born to the families, and we're living in Champaign, Illinois, right now, in this age, for a reason. That God's chosen us. And that every day, I believe, no matter what's happening, there's always some of that water in the glass. Something that we can point to and say, this might be happening, but the glass is half full, not half empty. Could you imagine if we church as people, and I'm not here but I want to be, lived a life that no matter what storm came our way, no matter what crisis arose, that we lit, were people who just thanked God and praised him, thanked him for his victory, thanked him for what he has done, what he is doing, what he's going to do? 
Could you imagine how that would change in hospitals? What people would think when we're just praising God, reminding ourselves who God is, reminding ourselves all the goodness that God has done in our lives and in scripture and everything that he's gonna do. That it would awaken people around us and it would awaken us. And guys, I'm gonna be real, it's not easy. It's not easy. All of us have been in storms. All of us have, are in hard situations even right now. But I wanna say, friends, your God is a God, my God is a God, our God is a God who fights for you. And a good dad doesn't give up on his kids. And he's not going to give up on you. And I believe the first thing, I got some little cousins I love and family I love. And you know what? When they need me, I'm there. When they need me, some of the best things I need is, is like, and I tell my girlfriend all this time, I'm like, hey, I just, can you just say you need me? Because when you need me, that pumps me up. That's like we're running in the football game, right? Like as guys, like we just want to be there to help people. Like call my name, I'll be there, you know? Like, like you know, but think about how, that's how God feels. When we call on him, he loves to answer our prayers. He loves to fight for us. And as we thank him, he opens the eyes of our heart to see him, to see him. And it starts making a difference in, my, in our lives. I remember when I got hired here, and I just think this is a funny story because everyone thought I was crazy, but I was super thankful for it. I got hired, and, you know, uh, we get a Mac, MacBook uh, laptop. And I've never had a MacBook in my entire life. Um, and like maybe some of you kids are like, man, I got MacBooks. There's nothing special about that. But for me, I was like, whoa, I get a MacBook? I was like, Mike, is this coming out of my paycheck or what's happening? He's like, he's like, no, man, we, we just, you, you can have that. I was like, I can have it? Like, what do you want from me? Like, you know, like, like thinking I was stepping into a trap, you know? But he's like, no, we bless this to you. I was like, I get a MacBook laptop, you know? And I, I just like, I remember like the look on his face. He's like, man, you're thankful for that. And I'm like, hey, you come from the mission field for three years, like eating rice and beans, you'll be thankful for a computer. But I was so thankful, and I think that blessed him for that, you know? And it's just like when we have an attitude and a heart posture of thankfulness, it inspires people around us. So I want to inspire us, church. What, let's be that people who are thankful, and I, I need your help. We need our help. We're meant to walk this out together, and some days we're not going to be able to believe, but that's when we look in each other in the eye and say, brother, sister, my friend, my family, I'm going to believe for you because that's what family does. I believe uh, the second thing that God wanted, us, God wanted me to share was the first aspect is having a thankful heart, and the second one is giving to the Lord. When we give to God, not because we have to, because we get to, do you know we don't do it for him, we do it for our own blessings. And that sounds weird and backwards, but I always thought I had to tithe. Every time a tithing message would happen, oh gosh, I have to tithe, I know I have to give money, I don't have enough. You know, as a missionary and a college student, I would never feel like I had enough money. I always just felt like I had to do this to make God happy. But I've realized through reading The Blessed Life and through studying for this message, that when we give to the Lord, gosh, he loves a cheerful giver. We give to the Lord because he's given so much to us, and we give to him because we want to, not because we have to. And I'll be honest, guys, I know that sometimes you're like, well, how am I going to pay my bills, and how am I going to do this? But I just want to say, step out in faith and see what happens. Listen to this verse in Proverbs uh, 5 through 10 from the message. Trust in the Lord from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure out everything on your own. Listen to God's voice in everything you do and everywhere you go. He's the one who will keep you on track. Don't assume that you know it all. Run to God. Run from evil. Your body will glow with health. Your very bones will vibrate with life. Honor God with everything you own. Give him the first and the best. And your barns will burst. Your wine vats will brim over with overflow. And I'll be honest, I don't say this braggadociously, but I've never tithed 10%. And reading just the first couple chapters of this book, I am so excited to tithe. I, I get paid in a week, and I'm not saying this to, you know, get brownie points with them, because I'm not giving them Mike or Hap. I'm giving to God, and God's going to bless this church because this is my home church. This is our home church. Heck, I, I'm here because you guys support us. You guys believe in us, and we come together, and we do this thing together. But you know what? We give to God, and I cannot wait to get paid. And my first money, the first fruits, is going to God. And I say this again, not braggadociously, but for the first time in my life, I'm going to give more than 10%. I'm going to give more than 10%. And my family and friends, I don't make a ton of money, but you know what? I'm rich in him, and I can't wait to give back to him, not because I have to, but because I get to. And I'm so excited. So I just want to encourage you, wherever you're at, just step out in faith. I think of the woman 
in the Gospels where Jesus get, says, this woman gave her last money, her last coin. And she said, he says, that is the most precious tithe and offering that's been given because it took faith to give it. She was giving her last money, her last coin, her last meal. But she did it out of a generous heart because she wanted to. And it took faith to do it. I'm, it's not easy for me to tithe. But when I step out in faith, whether that's praying for someone for healing, whether that's sharing the gospel with them, or tithing, or whatever God says go and do, I want to step in and do. Trust him that he's got my back. And he's an amazing father that will abundantly bless us and supply us with all we need. Will you, ta will you take a chance and will you trust him? Um, you know, the last aspect, the last point I felt like God said, so we have a thankful heart, we, we live with the attitude and the heart posture of thankfulness, and we give our first fruits, we give our best to God with our time, with our energy, with our health, with our bodies, and our finances. And then number three was this, that we would be generous people who bless and refresh others, that we would be a generous people with the generosity that we are ambassadors for Christ, and wherever we go, he goes that we would be a people who generously bless others. I love, again, going back to Proverbs, the wisdom book. Proverbs 11.25 says this, Blessed are those who refresh others, for they themselves will be refreshed and blessed. Wow, I love that. Blessed are those who refresh others. I want to be someone who refreshes people. I remember my dad said to me growing up one time, he said, Rye, be someone that brings the best out of people. Have you ever thought about when someone sees you walking down the street or sees your number, your phone number come up and call them, what do they think about you? Do they get excited to talk to you? I want to be someone that when I leave a conversation with someone, when I leave having lunch or hanging out with someone, they feel a little more inspired. They feel a little more encouraged. They feel a little more pumped up about life because they can feel and encounter the love of Jesus in me. Even on my worst days, God has something to offer through me and through you. I want to be someone that refreshes others and blesses others with everything God has given to me. And I know it's easy to say this from a stage, but I want to talk about this amazing student. Her name's Janet. We call her Joyful Janet. Um, she has just this amazing joy in her. And, you know, we were hanging out the other day. I meet, I meet with students all the time. Mike thinks I'm not working half the time, but I'm really on campus. So when you see me on campus, you can text him and let him know. I love you, Mike. We have, a, you know, we have that older bro relationship where we joke back around. But um, I, uh, I was on campus, and I'm meeting with Janet, and she, um, we, we're, you know, those, those parking meters, like, th those security guys or girls, man, they're, they're on top of their game. Like, five minutes, you're like, you got a ticket. So here's the story, guys. I got a ticket already this week, um, and it wasn't even in my car. <laughs> and so then I'm with Janet, and I was late again, you know, and I got another ticket, and it was for $50. And Janet's with me, and she's, um, she's from Ghana, and she's a medical student. She's about to leave for Minneapolis, and she's, she's going to just learn, and she wants to use everything that God's given her in her intelligence to help people know the Lord and to heal people uh, medically and spiritually. And she looked at me, and she's like, Ryan, I never carry cash on me, but I took out $40 today to buy a bike because my bike got stolen. And she was so bummed about her bike being stolen, but she's like, you know, I really feel like God's telling me to give this to you. And I was like, Janet, no, don't do that. Like, it's okay. Like, it's my fault. I can afford it. You know, I'll go beg Mike for money, you know. <laughs> and and, and um, kind, joking, kind of, you know. <laughs> if not, Claire Hap would have been my second call. So, um, you know, or went to Google, right? How do I get money, right, Google? Um, <laughs> Thanks for laughing. Um, so I, I, I went, um, and she's like, Ryan, please, I feel like God wants me to give this to you. Don't rob and steal this blessing from me. I was like, whoa. When someone says that, it's like, man, how can I say no now? And so she gives me this money, and it was humbling for me to accept that. And then she called me yesterday, and she's like, Ryan, Ryan, guess what? I'm like, what, Janet? You know, and she's like, I found a bike. She's like, God spoke to me, and I went online, and I was the first viewer. Someone is selling a bike for $10. And I'm like, well, Janet, wait, have you got the bike yet? Because what kind of bike is being sold for $10, you know? And she's like, no, I got the bike, I got the bike. And guess what? It has a lock. It's a bike with a lock. I think she was more excited about the lock than the bike, you know? <laughs> She was so excited about it. And she's like, I know it was God. And I know it was God because he told me to go online. And I was the first person to view this thing. And like, she's like, I thought back 
to how God put it on my heart to help you. And it took faith. I don't have a lot, but I did. And then I'll even just share this. A guy just came up after last service. And Janet wasn't even here, and he just put something in my hand. And he said, the Lord told me to give this to you. Go bless people. And right away, I didn't even know how much it was. I knew I was meant to give it to Janet. And gave it to her as she leaves from Minneapolis tomorrow. And I just know it's a way, Janet, that God's speaking to you and all of us. That he's a God who provides. He's Jehovah Jireh. He's a God that provides. He's a God that sees us. He's a God that loves us. And, and guys, like... I just want to be faithful. I want to be faithful in the little and be faithful with a lot. Will we be faithful? Going back to my story, I always saw everything negative. I have an aunt here who's like an older sister who's been there for me for everything. But I always felt alone. I always felt like an orphan. I never felt like my dad and my mom loved me even though they were working their butts off to provide for me. In my whole life, I've had a chip on my shoulder, feeling like I have to prove myself, that I'm not good enough. I'm not in the in crowd. And God, guys, that has, that has taken such a toll on my heart. But you know what? That's not the end of my story. Because when I was 21 years old, I asked Jesus Christ into my heart. And he became a distant God with a magnifying glass waiting for me to mess up to a loving father that loves me and that has been there for me every step of my life. And he began to change my attitude and open the eyes of my heart to help me realize how he's always been there for me, how he's always been fighting for me, how he's always been there to love me and guide me and help me. And I don't stand up here on a stage because it's my job or for my own accolades or my own fame or my own name. I should stand up here, one, because they blessed me with opportunity and they trust me, <laughs> but two, because Jesus has done something in my heart that I want all of you to know about, that he calls us rich that we are rich in Christ and there is so much more to life than meets the eye that we look to the author and perfecter of our faith knowing that there's so much more than the seen but we focus on the unseen and that we have treasures in heaven. So I want to say, church, as we look at these circumstances looking us in the eye, will we believe and declare that we are rich and the same God of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords lives in us? I want to have a thankful heart. I want to give to God whatever I have, even if that's my last coin. And I want to bless and have the faith like Janet did to help and give to others. And think about Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is a tax collector. He took money from people. He robbed people. He did things the wrong way. Jesus just looked at him and said, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house for dinner. And he's like, whoa, I'll give everything back that I've taken. I'll do everything. I'll make everything right that I did wrong. <laughs> like, Jesus just said, I'm coming over for dinner, and you're cooking dinner, Zacchaeus, you know? And he was willing to give everything back like that. And that's what the grace of God does for our lives. That's what his love does. His love bears all things, endures all things. It never gives up, and it always believes. I want to be someone that reflects that love. My good days are my worst days. And knowing that I am rich, that we are rich, and he lives within us. Will you pray with me? <sighs> Father, I just, I just humbly get on my knees, and I just say thank you. Thank you for this church. Thank you for this family. Thank you for your presence, God, and for sending Jesus to, to die for us and to save us. That he who was rich became poor so we could be rich. I, could, I joke around, God, about couldn't imagine a life without Google, but the reality is I couldn't imagine my life without you. So I pray that you bless this church, you bless this family, and you remind each and every one of us, whether this is our first time or hundredth time, how much you love us, and that you're a good, good father who sees us and who wants the best for our lives. Show us that you're fighting for us, God. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.